Yeah. Well, everyone, good evening. Uh, it's good to have campus open again. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, last week was, uh, was just insane. And uh, I mean, I was without power for six days and uh, campus was closed for like, was it, was it the entire week essentially? Because Monday was a holiday and then, oh wow, okay. And uh, so I'm sure everybody is still sort of recovering from their classes and also starting and then having this big disruption and everything. Um, so uh, what I, uh, what I wanna, I, there are a couple things I wanna do tonight. So uh, let's start off with uh, like prime minister's questions. All right, let's open it up for some Q and A. Um, you might have some things that are on your mind or some things that um, as you've been you know, working the last couple of days, they didn't have a chance to ask about on Slack. So let's get all those questions um, answered. Uh, first off, since we're all interacting here in real time. Um, and then I wanna spend uh, the majority of our time together tonight experiencing test-driven development. Uh, the big important component of this course um, and of the projects are the tests that you write. And normally we do that in week two, it's like a really important unit and stuff. And so um, we've, uh, I've, I've tried to clear as much space tonight for us to experience that. And we're gonna be doing that in a series of, uh, uh, there's gonna be a group activity that's part of it. Um, and then there's going to be uh, well, sort of more interactive coding thing where I'll be at the keyboard, but you'll be helping me decide what it is that uh, the that we'll end up coding. Um, so let's see here. And then um, that can very well take all of our time together tonight. I want to make sure that we go into enough depth and we pace ourselves appropriately um, for that. Um, however, there are uh, a couple of handouts that, uh, that are, you know, have some really important information about um, requirements for your projects, and then I want to assign projects two and three tonight also. Um, I pre-recorded all of that. I don't know if it makes sense to watch it back here in real time. Um, maybe uh, between questions and, and things like that, we can uh, sound like somebody live, but I didn't see anybody in the waiting room. Okay. Um, we can uh, figure all of that stuff out. But let's start out with uh, questions. Um, what can I tell you? What have been uh, some of your experiences so far uh, in the course? Um, what are some topics that uh, you're really curious about? Some things you'd like me to expand upon on any questions? Uh, let's do it. Right, the question for project is, for question is for project one, should we do in test driven development? Um, the requirement is, is that you have well tested code, that you have at least 75% of your lines um, covered by tests. So you have to write tests. Um, do you have to do test driven development? I have no way of, uh, of uh, assessing that. And so it's sort of really an exercise up to you. Um, hey, you can you know, write the code and write the tests afterwards um, and you know, get a fine grade. Um, however, uh, I hope what you get appreciation and get curious about tonight is doing trust test driven development where you think about what it is that you want to bring into creation, you write a test that demonstrates it, you see that test, test fa 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 fail, and then you make that test. Um, but uh, I haven't figured out how to, whether or not you're truly doing test driven development, but I do look at to make, to make sure that you have sufficient test coverage. Question. Ah, great. So how do you, you say that 75% of your code must be uh, covered by your test? How do you measure that? Um, there is, I'll talk about it briefly here and go into more detail, uh, or we'll see if we have time to go into more detail uh, later. There's this how to test your projects handout. And this has, you know, all the information uh, about the testing requirements. And basically, uh, we, we saw, you know, last time that when you run the Maven command, this is, does things with the project. And you want, when you run with a dash capital P greater uh, profile enabled, um, what that does is that when your tests run, both your unit tests and your integration tests, and we'll talk about the difference between those two things tonight, um, they run with a tool called Jococo for Java code coverage. I'm sorry, let me make my screen visible for everybody. Um, that will uh, basically measure or annotate 
um, the lines that are executed by the tests and then generates a little report. And I have it configured so that uh, the build will, um, does the build fail? It might. Yeah, I think the, I think the build fails um, if you have less than 75% of the JVM instructions um, covered. And so then you can determine your progress towards that 75% goal by uh, running a command like this. Um, although one of the neat things about uh, test driven development is that if you're doing TDD, um, you likely end up with at least 75% of your code uh, tested because you start from writing uh, start from writing tests. Um, but yep, that's how uh, that's how I will assess that. Good question. I just wanted to take a moment to um, sort of reiterate. I posted about this on Slack during the week over the weekend. I can't remember when. Um, about I guess it was over the weekend about like how the uh, how, how the the structure of the course changed or how, how the timeline of the course changed uh, because we didn't have a class last week. So um, I, I kept the quizzes the 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 same. Um, uh, I didn't want to move too much stuff. I didn't really want to. Uh, well, yeah, I didn't have too much stuff to do. Um, at the same time. So uh, the quizzes are the same, and it looks like people are keeping up for the quizzes uh, for the most part. Um, if there was a quiz that, quiz that you weren't able to take, I'm happy to open up uh, quiz one or two for a couple more days so you can do that. Um, I know we've all still been digging out of, uh, hopefully, you know, when people have been digging out of snow, but we're still digging out of life. Um, so just, uh, you know, uh, DM me or send me an email or something like that um, about the quizzes. Um, I've kept the, uh, yeah, I've kept the, the, the lectures, the screencasts um, at the same pace. Uh, again, I'm hoping that's something that you can do asynchronously, assuming again that you have access to internet and power uh, and everything. We know if you need a little bit more accommodation on that, but I kept it all the same. What I moved was the projects, um, because especially here at the beginning, yeah, the projects can seem kind of big. And um, if, uh, you know, if you didn't have a chance to get off the ground, last week while uh you know if you were without power or without internet um you know i know that i want to give people some extra time for that so um project one which was originally due tonight was uh pushed out uh, another week um and so that will be due uh next week and basically i then sort of cascaded projects two and three i guess project yeah project two is then due the week after that um and so then uh, we'll talk about project two tonight or rather project two is assigned tonight and then uh, project three, I'm also assigning it tonight, but it's not due until the 21st because the cones are due on the 14th. So uh, there is something due every week, um, but, uh, but I tried to space it out so it's only one thing due every week instead of having a bunch of things all piled up. Um, similarly, other, uh, other assignments in the how to document your projects. Um, handout, uh, there is something called the plan of attack, a POA, which uh, is basically an email that describes uh, your approach to your project. Uh, and that is due uh, three days or 72 hours before the project is due. So this coming Sunday night, the POA for project one is due because project due is due a week from tonight. And again, we can go into more details about this later. Um, but that's sort of how the assignments uh, and stuff change. And I think we'll still be able to, um, I, I think that will still be a workable pace, but let me know. Um, and try to let me know sort of in advance of, hey, if there's something that you're, that's blocking you, or you know, if you're finding that, that it's a lot. So the other thing that I changed was, uh, tonight was supposed to be the first night of pair programming. That will be next week. Um, and so please come to class and be in person next week. Um, so next week, um, I, I'm asking you all to come to class, and then the first mob programming, which is yep, on February 21st. Um, I'd also like you to be in class. Uh, it's a hybrid course, um, and while you know, as I said last week, or sorry, on week one, um, the vast majority of it can be experienced remotely, and you'll, you'll have a fine experience. Um, when it comes to uh, learning about and getting a first experience with pair programming and with mob programming. I would like to be, that to be in person. Um, and so please plan on coming to campus uh, next week. Um, and I'll talk more about what the um, expectations are for the other pairing and mobbing sessions uh, then. And if there's a, you know, a reason that you can't get, hey, you can't 
the child care or you're like, uh, uh, you, know, you know, ill or something, just please let me know and I can accommodate it. But again, I want people to experience um, a pair programming here in the classroom in person. Um, and I'll talk about uh, other ways to experience it later. Okay. So that's how we've adjusted the course to accommodate uh, the, the, week, the week of uh, non-involvement. Um, what else can I tell you? How, how are things going on the projects and the cones? Um, there hasn't been a lot of chatter on Slack, but then I realized there's only 10 people working over the course, so uh, you know maybe things are going fine. But how are people finding the experience so far? How, how are people finding the cones? How are you doing on the cones? I'm seeing some thumbs up here, okay? Um, Again, it's due in a couple of weeks, so you know you probably should be you know, a little bit more than a halfway done by now if you want to stay on pace. Okay, good. People are saying good. 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 Uh, I'm, I'm glad. I hope that it's giving you an introduction to the language that you're starting to see how the the various constructs are used. Now, I know we still get another week for Project One, but how's Project One going? Um, I mean, I hope you at least had a chance to sort of look at it and study it and maybe, you know, figure out what you're doing, even if you haven't uh, written a lot of code. Um, but, uh, but I think after tonight, uh, you should have, you know, everything you need to uh, focus on that uh, and get it in uh, for next week, um, if not sooner, because I'll, I'll introduce projects uh, two and three, and project two is due uh, the week after, uh, after the next one. Okay. Yes. Yes, part of one question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you are going to get your wish for unit testing because that's what we're going to see tonight. So yep, tonight is all about uh, how to figure out what you want to test and then how to implement the tests and then how to get it working. And we'll talk about both unit tests and integration tests um, and the difference between the two and how they apply to of your project. So come to the right place. Awesome. Okay. Well, any other questions or any other topics we want to talk about before we start diving into things for, uh, for unit tests? Testing. No? Okay then. Um, so I created this Google Doc for us to uh, collaborate on. And I am going to, I'll post it in Slack. Uh, again, I think it was on here, but yeah. The, uh, let's collaborate on this document. Let's see here, I'll make sure that it is, can I open it up for everybody? Share public on the web, we can't open, it's a, it's a open up for permissions, make sure that everybody can edit. Yeah. I think we should be able to edit that. Okay, oh, I'm going to close this window so that everybody can see. Okay, so actually, I think I'll start out with a question. Um, what, what, if anything, have you experienced in your academic career or professional career? Um, regarding testing, um, you know, hey, we all write programs, and I'm sure you've tested in something, but what have been some of your approaches that you've used when testing your, your programs? Oh, right, yeah, debugging with print statements. Yep, right and true. Yeah, don't knock it. Oh, assert statements. Uh, what, what language were you using asserts with? Cool. Okay. Okay. So you've done some PyTest before. Is PyTest like introduced in the curriculum or is it sort of a, a, a side project? Or? Nice. Okay, good. So maybe we've maybe experienced a little bit of testing and seen it before in Python. Um, good. That, that, that didn't used to be the case. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad that uh, we've seen some testing now. Hmm. Oh, cool. Oh. Okay. Nice. Okay. So yeah. So who's so covering your software development course? Was it software engineering? Which I'm just curious which course it was. The software engineering course. Okay. Good. So maybe you're a, a little bit familiar uh, with, with that. And oh yeah, it looks like 
Thanks for posting, Nora. There's some requirements for unit testing for projects, but TDD is not really taught, especially in lower division. Okay, and, and that's fine. Um, uh, you know, test driven development is still, I think it's fair to say, is emerging practice, even though it's been around for a long time. Um, you know, and I, I think it's something that, uh, that it takes a certain discipline to do, and uh, not everybody's built a discipline yet. But awesome. Okay, well, we're, we're going to see that here. Um, and uh, we'll be, uh, you know, tonight, I think it's fair to say that I'll be demonstrating test driven development uh, to you all. And then when we do the, the pair and the mob programming, um, well, in, in all the programming that you do, whether it's pair, pair programming, the mob programming, or your own programming, you'll have an opportunity to um, you know, apply it yourself and experience it. So, so to, to structure our, our discussion tonight, I want to talk about behavior scenarios, which are, you know, are things that specify the expectations that you have about your software, right? Uh, you know, all, you know, all software does is takes inputs and turns them into outputs, right? Um, and uh, as a human that interacts with the software, you have expectations for, well, when I provide it with these inputs, I expect those outputs. Um, and, and so what we're going to do is uh, talk about behavior scenarios and then implement those scenarios using test driven development for uh, this Project Zero student class. Um, that I have. This is something that's in the vein of your uh, of your projects, um, but uh, is is not one of your projects. Um, but before we dive into the details of coding, before we look at the the, the J unit um, uh, the, the J unit APIs, which I hope you've all uh, watched the J unit uh, the, the lecture, because I'm not really going to go into the details too much. Um, I, I wanted to. Uh, show you and explore some techniques for defining your tests and really then again define those expectations that we have of our software. So um, a common and what I find to be a very effective way to capture what behavior you expect out of your programs um, is to use this given when then structure. Um, it's just one of the really nice things where it's like it's super simple um, and, and very effective. So when you're thinking about expressing expected behavior or behavior you expect, um, there are sort of three aspects of it that are effective to convey and capture. One is called, oh, the first one is called given. And this is sort of like what you expect to be in place before the test. So this is the, like I say, the, the initial context uh, at the beginning of the scenario. This is like, hey, the setup for your program or the setup for the test. So like, here's what I expect to be in place. And so, okay, given those conditions, when something happens. And this is the behavior that you want to test, right? This could be, you know, hey, when I invoke this method or when I you know, take this action or whatever, this is the thing that it triggers a scenario that um, uh, you know, launches the test, this is the thing that you, you are testing. And then the then part is, well, this is the outcome you expect. So, you know, hey, the, the, if the when, if the given is sort of the inputs and the when is the action, then the then is uh, what you expect for the outcome. Um, and so then that is something uh, that you say, hey, you know, then I expect this to be the case, and your test validates that. And that's, the, that's the validation part of your test. Um, now, these scenarios um, can be captured in plain English, and, you know, anyone who can read English can uh, understand that. It's just well written. Um, and, uh, and oftentimes are um, expressed either directly by the user or someone representing the user um, or someone talking to a user. Uh, again, the whole idea here is to, uh, to be able to capture your expectations in a way that everybody can point to and say, oh yeah, that's what I accept. We all agree on that, uh, ex ex uh, that, that, exception, that expectation. So you've got those and then there are a bunch of ways to, to, to implement it. Um, we're not going to talk about it here in this class, uh, but there are, um, there are tools uh, that you may be familiar with, like Cucumber or JBehave, that uh, provide a, uh, a syntax for expressing given when then scenarios that can be interpreted both by a computer program and by a human. Um, this is really great because what you end up with is an automated test for your given when then scenario. Um, we're not going to do that, however, you know, I make you learn enough about uh, JUnit and APIs and things like that. Uh, so we're just going to use JUnit and Hamcrest, which are the things that um, are, uh, you know, are discussed in the lectures and um, that I use throughout the course. 
Um, if you want to learn more about this, uh, there's a couple of resources that I find uh, very helpful. So Dan Terhorst, Terhorst North um, uh, defined this thing called behavior-driven development, which is more about focusing on the scenarios, not so much the tests. Um, but if you want to learn more about it, I highly recommend the, the, the link I have there. Um, there's also a really good article from Martin Fowler, again, about how you can leverage given when then and when it makes sense to use it. Um, so any questions on that? Has anybody seen this before? Has anybody worked with uh, the, this, this format or has any experience with it they want to share? No? No, it's okay. Sorry, I think my was my uh, Slack. I think I think um, oh, it's the chat. Yeah, cool. Uh, okay, well then, so uh, here's what we're going to do next. Um, what I'd uh, like to do is, is go into you know, to, to, to a breakout room. Let's see here, how many people do we have? We have seven. Yeah, let's, let's do two breakout rooms then. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll randomly assign you to a breakout room. Uh, so we'll have uh, three and four there. We'll have three people here in the classroom. Um, and what, uh, what I'd like to do, actually, I'll walk through the student, uh, student project to give everybody an introduction of it. And then we'll brainstorm and capture some uh, usage scenarios for the student class and the student project um, using this given when then format um, to, uh, to then say, hey, here's what we expect um, from our student class when we provide various inputs. Um, let's see here. We'll also divide up uh, between um, folks that focus on the uh, testing the class itself versus the command line program for that class. And uh, then you know, we'll go off and brainstorm for a little while. We'll come back, we'll discuss the scenarios, and then we'll implement the scenarios using uh, test-driven development. So yep, I see lots of people uh, clicking on the link. And let's see here, I think everybody in the classroom's got uh, a laptop, and hopefully you're following along. Uh, let me just talk about what this Project Zero is all about. Um, so many, many, many years ago, um, this was the, the first project in the class, and then I realized that there wasn't enough difference between this simple student, progr student programming and Project 1 to you know, uh, make, it worth, make it worthwhile. But I do use it now as an example of, uh, of doing this development and doing the kind of development that you'll do for your projects. So uh, there's, um, I'll, I'll create the, the, the student class. Um, yeah, uh, I'll do that after we do the brainstorming. But the whole idea is that you've got uh, one class and uh, that, that you're working with, it's called student. Um, a student is a subclass of uh, my human course. And if you, um, I guess what, it's probably like the, the, the object-oriented, pro the, like the full length object-oriented programming um, slides go into this. Um, you can learn all about that. But the whole idea is that uh, a student uh, has a human, it inherits a, uh, a says method, I think, from that, um, and also a name, uh, all humans have a name. And a student has uh, this constructor, and so a student has some properties, uh, it has a name, it takes an array list of classes that are all strings, it takes a, a GPA as a double, and then a gender as a string, and a gender is defined as male, female, or other. Um, case insensitive. So here we have a Java doc that describes all of the, uh, the parameters to this constructor for student. And by the way, this is the skeleton of the code because you need to implement it, but this is what you start with. And then there are a couple of uh, methods that, uh, not, uh, that there are a couple of instance methods, neither of which is implemented. Um, the first one is a method called says that returns a string. And all students say the same thing. They say this class is too much work. Um, clearly, that's not implemented yet because what the, we get out of the box is a uh, method that throws on supported operation exception. And then all, uh, all, all students override the two string method um, to uh, provide a description, which is um, more details are below uh, in the project. And then it has a main method that will parse the command line, and the format of the command line is given below, but basically, it's all the information about a student. They'll create one of these students and print out uh, the value of its two-string method to standard output. But out of the box, you get uh, 
um, a main method that uh, prints just a, a, an error message for some kind of grand line arguments. Um, let's see here. Oh, um, you know what? The Simon still talks about using the getting started repository. We're not going to do that. Instead, I'll create it in my repository and you can play along. For this one, you're not writing the code, but you're working with me to, to write the code. But here's how to run it if you are so inclined. I think what's um, important here is, is this right here. So this talks about the behavior, roughly speaking, that, that we expect. Um, so let's see here. If we just run the, the jar with no arguments, it should print missing command line arguments. Um, otherwise, if you provide it with input like uh, Dave, mail, 3.64, algorithms, operating systems in Java, it should print out the following. So this is the value of the two string. Uh, Dave has a GPA of 3.64 and is taking three classes, colon, algorithms, operating systems in Java. He says this class is too much work. So that's, you know, the kind of, that, that's the, at the, uh, at the, at the most general, since that is the behavior of the program, um, when you provide those uh, inputs on the command line, this is what should be print out to standardize. Um, and of course, just like your uh, projects, um, you know your program should exit gracefully with a user-friendly error message under all reasonable error conditions. So, uh, and this is actually part of what we'll explore tonight in our uh, definition of our scenarios both sort of the happy path, you know, all the inputs are, are nice, but also what are some of the conditions or what are some of the expectations when the inputs might not be uh, what, you, uh, what you suggest or, or what you um, expect or um, sort of what, what inputs that don't necessarily, aren't expected to result in a happy outcome. Um, you know, uh, so it, I, I, I used this project for many years, and uh, a while ago, uh, a student pulled me aside. Um, and because at the time, I represented gender as a bully, having two values. And uh, the, the student very uh, graciously um, educated me on why that's not effective. And if, uh, if you will, I, I'd like to just take a couple moments to speak as a software developer um, on why it's important that our software be inclusive. Um, uh, the, the student whose uh, name uh, was, uh, was, was Trina, I think I, I call that out here. Oh, yeah, okay, Casper, uh, sorry, I've changed it since then. Um, reached out to me um, and, and basically explained to me like the following. It's like, I'm, I'm speaking as, as the person. Um, you know, gender isn't a balloon, it's not male or female. I consider myself something else. And as a result, I can't use your software. And like, that really hit me. Um, that it's like, oh, wait a second. I, I want to produce something that people can use. And if I don't uh, support their use case, if I don't accommodate what, uh, what, you know, how, how they want to use my, my software, they don't use it. And so for me, other than uh, it being sort of more I think to do and fair um, and, and just also for practical considerations, for understanding who your users are, and how they want to use your software. Um, and so then, uh, you know, I, I worked with them to understand, hey, how should I convey this? What's the right way to, uh, what was an appropriate and effective way uh, to model this? Um, and so then uh, in, in, instead of being a Boolean, it became a string with options. Um, and we agreed that, uh, you know, hey, you, you can't have, uh, you need to know how to interpret it. So, uh, you know, we, we said, okay, we'd have three options. Uh, male, female, and other, and that would be sufficient for now. Um, it might need to evolve in the future. Um, but because, you know, identifying pronouns are, is part of this, uh, is pro part of this uh, software, part of this program, um, we wanted to be clear about what the expected behavior ought to be. So anyway, um, that's something I'd like to point out as part of this. For me, it was a very important uh, learning as a software engineer and something that I wanted to pass on uh, to all of you. Okay, but back to the program. Um, uh, before we break out in, into breakout rooms, do some brainstorming and collaborate on the Google document, any questions about the expectations of, uh, of the student project and sort of generally speaking, um, what, uh, what you think you should do? Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to the uh, Google document again. Oops, document again. 
Um, so again, there are going to be two breakout rooms. So what did I say? The odd number breakout room will be uh, focusing on the scenarios for the student class, which will be this first part right here. So uh, the way I've structured this, I said, hey, listen, uh, this is going to be start talking about the code behavior not the command line behavior. So uh, basically we're saying, hey, when I provide various values to the student constructor, what do I expect the behavior to be um, with regards to, well, to string or any, creating the object or any other um, behavior. And because there are four inputs to the uh, student class's uh, constructor, um, uh, you know, I figured I'd structure the table this way. And so then, uh, you know, for each scenario, you can specify uh, what kind of uh, input you want. So for instance, hey, you know, any valid value, oops, any valid value of, uh, of, of those parameters, um, when you create the student and invoke the says method, the result of the says method will be this class is too much work. Similarly, when you provide that same example from the, the project assignment, they're not very creative, uh, you provide those same uh, inputs to the constructor. When you invoke the uh, two string method, then yep, you'll get that uh, example that was specified there in the assignment um, in terms of how that data is then formatted in the two string. And so then if you are part of a group that is working on the uh, scenarios for the student class, um, then uh, you know, your job will be to talk and discuss about what your expectations are. So again, for you know, the given inputs, when you perform something, uh, I was probably just looking at the student method, um, or maybe not, maybe it's like, hey, maybe you know, if I, there's a, value, a bad value, I throw an exception or something. Yeah, I don't, it's up to you. Right? I don't know what the right answer is here, um, but, uh, but uh, what, what I want you to do is think about it, think critically about it, brainstorm, and then come up with the various scenarios um, that, your, uh, that your code will, will work with. If you are in the even uh, break, uh, breakout room and folks here in the class can choose whichever room they want, there's only three of you, so uh, you're a room to yourself and you decide whether or not uh, you work on the uh, command line arguments or the um, uh, or, or the constructor uh, parameters. Um, so the same thing here. There's not so much of a given because basically the given is like, yep, you can run the executable jar. But when you provide command line arguments like the following, then um, you know certain text is written to uh, standard output, and then nothing is written to standard error. And so then again, brainstorm uh, the input and output values that you expect. Capture them here. Um, and we'll spend uh, 20 minutes doing that. And then what we'll do is we'll come back, we'll discuss them, and we'll start implementing them uh, using uh, unit tests, and we'll uh, explore tests from development that way. I'll create the breakout rooms, but any questions about, uh, about this? Hope everybody is able to access the Google Doc. Um, I encourage you to talk and to, uh, to collaborate. I'll pause the recording. You did. Thanks, Katie. Uh, yeah, I was watching the Google Doc go by, and lots of lots of great stuff, lots of good ideas. Um, and you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, not everybody interpreted things exactly the same way, which is which is good. Which is actually not part of the exercise, part of the lesson here, right? Um, you know, some talk here in the classroom. It's like, oh yeah, there's a lot of detail in the doc document, and you know, some things people you know interpret it different ways, and uh, and so this is good. Um, uh, I, I'm curious about your experience. Uh, brainstorming on, on on this and what it was like. So uh, what I'd like, uh, I'm going to ask uh, room one, then we'll do here in the classroom, then we'll do uh, breakout room two, just to talk about like what the experience was like for you and um, if there was anything noteworthy that you, uh, you wanted to call out. So people in room one, that was Aiden, Amanda, Natalie, and Sharon, uh, what would you think? Um, what, what was it like for you and is there any uh, roles of wisdom that you'd like to uh, share with uh, with everybody else? Uh, I thought the instruction was good. Um, maybe we were the ones misinterpreting it, but uh, while we were talking, it's interesting to see other people's inputs at the same time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I think uh, each of us kind of gave our inputs. It's not, of course, as interactive as in person, for sure, for me. 
truth be told, it wasn't that interactive in the classroom either. But anyway, um, we'll get to hear their experience in a moment. Anybody else from Room 1 have something that they, uh, they want to share? Um, I have, um, well, when we, at some point after all this, all these uh, scenarios were put on the list, I mean, I personally couldn't think of any other ones, but maybe like when you start running tests or like running the program, some scenarios might come up that we didn't think about. Yeah, yeah that's a good observation. Amanda. Yeah, you all, you very often discover more and one of the things about test driven development that I, I really came to understand and appreciate is that when you can't think of any more tests to write, you're done. That's how you know, right? You know, right? I had to think about it. When you're doing your, you know, projects, well, maybe you know you're done because you have to go turn it in, or otherwise it'd be late. But with test driven development, uh, you know, literally, it's when okay, I've written all the tests, I know how to to, to write. I guess that's that's it. You're done and. Um, once I experienced that, I really understand, understood the power in knowing when I'm complete or knowing when I'm ready to share it with someone else. Um, because uh, not only that felt real good, you have the finality to it, um, but also uh, it's, uh, you know, you have this confidence in then delivering it to, to other people. Awesome. Thanks, room one. Folks here in the classroom, okay, what was your experience like and uh, what were some of the things that you noticed about this exercise? Different interpretations of uh, of the assignment. Was there anything in particular that uh, that you kind of went back and forth on? Just to amplify it, because I'm not sure if, if my microphone or my laptop picked it up, um, you know, a, a couple of things that were called out. Uh, you know, the first one was uh, when it comes to interpreting, and I'll use the word validating, the, 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 the gender, you know, what is the appropriate behavior when it's not male, female, or other? Um, and I think the assignment, uh, you know, what, while it said that, yes, hey, for the, for the sake of, uh, of instruction, we will call, only accept those, those three, it, but it does beg the question, like, is that the right thing to do? And when we write the we write the way, you know, we, uh, we think it's appropriate for this exercise, we have that control. Um, and the other one uh, was he pointed out that, you know, as he got to look at how, what, what other people, how other people had uh, defined the scenarios, there were things that, you know, he wasn't sure if that was necessarily correct or sufficient. And um, this is one of the things that you get to experience when you do pair programming, mob programming where in real time, you'll be able to share those and, uh, you know, and figure out, okay, well, how do we want to move on? Um, and it's perfectly fine to, you know, make a decision, try it out for a little bit, and if it doesn't serve you well, you go back and do it. Yeah. Go back and fix it. Um, change it, do something else. Software is really malleable. And for me, that's, I think, the coolest thing about it is that it's, uh, compared to anything in the physical world, it's so easy to change. Other thoughts from people here in the classroom? Mm, how to handle nulls, yeah. Yeah, right. What's you know, what's appropriate, what's not? The assignment wasn't you know clear about that. And part of this is is that yeah, there's only so many spe you know specific specifics in the assignment. There's like project assignments. And then there is, yeah, there's some that is you know, sort of left to your judgment uh, and to figure out whether or not, you know, to figure out what the right way to respond to that scenario is. Right. Anything else? Cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Room two, uh, Cameron, Katie, and Nora, what was your experience like? Now, you all worked on the, um, on the command line, not the constructor. Um, How did you find that? 
Um, I thought it was pretty easy for the most part. The only thing is you can't really, I found that you couldn't really test the, some of the parameters, like, uh, the classes that they're taking since they're just strings. There's not as many things to test. I guess there would be like length, like a minimum and maximum maybe. Um, but for the most part, like we have a lot, a lot of testing on the GPA with like negative values or values are too high, stuff like that, or maybe inputting a string there. Nice. Yeah. Other observations from people in room two they like to share? Yeah. Um, so one thing that I thought about was like, how many classes is a student allowed to take before this program is like, hey, that's way more than any student would ever take. So I made the limit at six, but it wasn't really like specified in the assignment. So I feel like it's up for interpretation here. And you're right, when it's not specified in the assignment, like you have to make a call. And yeah, and, th and that's good. Um, boundary testing and understanding uh, the extremes of, of, of your software is a very important thing to, to consider um, because uh, you, nev you, know, you, you never know what people are going to put in and so then uh, what the user will provide for input. And so, yeah, you know, thinking about that and figuring out, okay, where, where do we want to enforce things or maybe where we want things to leave things more open-ended. Um, and the nice thing about tests is that you will know what happens uh, at those boundary conditions. So. Okay. Great. Well, hey, thank you for going through the exercise. Hope it gives you a good idea of the scenarios that uh, we'll implement. Um, let's take a, take a 10 minute break, uh, nine minutes. We'll come back at 6.40. Um, and uh, we'll start writing some code. Um, I'll uh, create a, uh, a new project for this, and we'll start looking at how to implement this stuff uh, using uh, JUnit and IntelliJ and so like that. All right, we'll see you in a little bit. Okay, we're back, I'm not on mute. So uh, in the first part of class, we talked about uh, behavior scenarios and then a bit of brainstorming for the student project. Um, I was looking over these. These are uh, some really good test cases. And uh, I, I think here's what I'd like to do next. Uh, let's start implementing them. And so uh, what we'll do is we'll create a, uh, a new project, um, uh, open it up in, in GitHub and open up in IntelliJ. We'll implement some unit tests first for the uh, student class. We'll buy invoking its instructor. So we'll look at a bunch of these first. Um, and then we'll move on, uh, and that that will tell. And we'll focus on unit testing. We'll learn about J unit. We'll look about look at uh, a number of the um, assertion uh, the statement the assertion capabilities that are available with J unit and Hamcrest. Um, and we'll take a break. That'll probably be you know, four or ten minutes, an hour or so. And then we will uh, focus on these scenarios for the command line program. Um, and this is where we'll get to see uh, integration tests that allow you to interact with your main method uh, and then the standard output and standard error. Um, and all of that, uh, all that stuff is, is well required for your projects. Uh, we'll give you an opportunity to uh, really test your code to make sure that it does what um, you expect it to do. So uh, let's get started first by creating the, um, by creating a uh, student project. Let's see if that's me. Yeah. So uh, when you create projects, you need to do it from the, the PSU machines. And so then, uh, let's see, uh, this is the repository that we created in week one, right? This is the thing where we had the getting started repository and we cloned it. Um, this is what, uh, what you'll, you, know, you, you created one for yourself, for your projects. Um, there is a, a create student project um, script. And so you run that. Stuff there. Um, and now if we look at git status, great, we see that the POM, top level POM is modified because we added a new project, and that we also have a student, excuse me, a uh, student directory now, which has all the uh, student files. So we will add those two. 
Actually, we should probably run uh, Maven W clean verify just to make sure that the new code works before we commit it to GitHub. So when I run uh, Maven clean verify for the top level directory, it will uh, do the clean and verify for all of the projects. So it's doing it for the appointment book, which we created in week one. It'll probably run the cones also, and now it'll run it for students. Yeah, let's take a little bit longer than I wanted. Yeah, it's just it's doing its thing though. You can watch it go by. Um, the the student project is very much like the appointment book project in that it has you know a handful of classes out of the box, and it has um, canned or has pre-created unit tests and integration tests. Great, all that was happy. So um, let's did I commit it. I can't remember. I do not. Um, and say, let's see here. Added uh, student project. Uh, student project. Yeah. Push that up to GitHub. Oh, looks like there were some things I hadn't uh, pulled in. So I will actually let me just dive into this for anybody who's watching or anybody that wants to know what's happening. Um, basically what had happened is that my local checkout was out of date with GitHub. And so then before it would let me push my local changes up to GitHub, I had to, I need to pull down the changes from GitHub that had been made, um, independent, uh, in parallel with the changes I've made to my local repository. So it can reconcile all the changes and look for, um, merge conflicts. So I'll just pull that. Oops. Once more. And Uh, what is it telling me? I have divergent branches and you specify how to reconcile them? I do? Oh, interesting. Okay, so let's see here. Um, yeah, I like using merge. So I will say rebase false. Uh, yeah, I'll do this on a per, per repository basis. Let's try to pull again. And yes, go ahead and merge. I don't forget to comment. Oh, I guess I had done something about assertions. Okay, cool. Uh, so I pulled that. Now I can push that. So I mean, this is just one of the things that you deal with with uh, with, with Git and GitHub. So even though like only one person me is contributing to this repository, there are changes made outside, and so then uh, you know you need to reconcile them. And luckily, Git makes this so easy to do. Um, Kids today don't know how good you have it. Back in the old days, before we had tools that were advanced as Git, this, this is the kind of thing where you would spend an entire day trying to get it right and then realize you overwrote somebody's code and things were compiled and broken. It was pretty bad. So then, nice. Okay, so now I think I've uh, finally got that here. I'm going to exit out of the PSU machine because now I want to develop locally. Uh, yep, here I am back on my, my own machine. And I am going to open up IntelliJ. Um, and so I have the uh, the project here, my Portland State Winter uh, Java Winter Twenty Twenty Four repository. Oh, but by the way, you know me jumping around all over the place. Um, I want to let everybody know about the um, oh, what is this? Yeah. Um, uh, just I just want to post the link to this uh, to this code so that if you want to play along at home, uh, oh yep, that's the change I made just a minute ago. Here is the uh, repository. Okay. Cool. So uh, last time I had uh, you know opened up the project in IntelliJ. Um, I'm going to try to stay in IntelliJ as much as possible tonight. Uh, and so then I'm going to do the following. I am going to uh, hear from, I'll just do it from the menu, I guess, as a, an example under the Git menu. You say uh, get update project, which will uh, do a pull of the current branch and get any new branches uh, that have been uh, created. And it says, yeah, merge incoming. This is if you want to merge or rebase. I like merging, it makes no sense to me. So I will do that. So this doesn't get pull for me. I don't have to do it from the command line. 
And uh, when I do it, uh, you might have noticed that a new student directory um, uh, showed up. And IntelliJ saw that the student directory contains a POM file, said, oh, this is a Maven project. I know about this. And then it configured it to be a Maven project. Uh, sorry, configured it to be an IntelliJ project within that. And uh, the one of the ways you know that is that uh, it recognizes the student class as Java source code. Uh, as Java source code, uh, not just like a uh, .java file. So the project that I created on the, uh, when I ran the create student script, create student project script, um, generated uh, some, some, some code, and this is the code that was there in the assignment. So here we have the, uh, the skeleton of the, uh, of the student class. Now, uh, another thing that it created um, in the student uh, directory, a subdirectory called tests, and so in, sorry, sorry, source test Java, um, inside the package, there is a student test class. And we saw this briefly on uh, week one, but I want to go into it you know, some more here. Um, the, uh, so, so, you know, when you are writing tests, it's good to have them uh, separate, but not too far away from your, your test code. So what Maven does is it, uh, it has this, this, this structure that follows these conventions like all the source code goes in the source directory, and then there's like the main subdirectory of that, where uh, your your main class goes, where your main code goes. It's like the production code, and then your unit tests for that go in a test directory. Um, and uh, so here is where the, the student test is. Now the student test out of the box um, uh, basically uh, validates that. Uh, well, it does the following. You uh, have a, uh, a name that is part of the test. This is kind of the, um, I guess you can think of this as you know, the given part of the, of the scenario. So it's like, hey, listen, I've got you know, a name, Pat. When I create a uh, student, uh, well, actually, no, not so much. This is, this is all part of the given, I suppose. Both these two lines are. So given that I've created a student named Pat, um, I've created a uh, student the name of Pat. And then uh, this is kind of combining the both of the asserts. When uh, Pat's I get name was invoked, well, when you know I get Pat's name, the student's name, name. And that's kind of this first part here. Then the name is Pat. Oops. And the when, in, in this case, the when and the then are uh, codified in this assertion statement. So uh, here I'm using the assert that method from, uh, from Hamcrest. I am uh, doing a static import of the assert that method from the matcher assert class inside the Hamcrest library. Um, and so I say assert that pat.getName, so I call get name from pat, and I assert that that value is equal to the name that I expect this name variable. Um, we'll see, I'm sure later you can have things like, you know, contains string or has length or, you know, uh, things like that. But right now we're doing a simple equals to comparison. And this is a basic unit test, right? Where we are uh, validating a very simple piece of functionality that when I create a student, that the student's name is, is Pat. Um, and I can run this test by uh, clicking the little, uh, you know, play um, uh, button here in the, in the gutter. And it'll give me the opportunity to run it or debug it. Right now, we're just gonna run it. Uh, and we'll do that. And so we're running it through IntelliJ. And so, you know, IntelliJ, uh, because it knows how to deal with Maven projects, it knows what test code is, it knows what code under test is. And when I ran it, it said everything passed, right? It said one of one test passed. And you see over here on the left that you get green check marks everywhere. That's a good thing. So, you know, this was meant to, to work out of the box. It's a, it's a very simple test. So that is uh, the, the first test there. Um, now, let's start implementing some other tests. 
So um, this is where I like your your help. Like, what are the what, what's the let's see here, um, not the command line program for the uh, for let, let's look at the student class. We'll do the main method um, in a while. Uh, what is a good next test to implement? Oh, line number three. Oh, and also someone waiting on chat. Uh, a constructor test. Yes, definitely a constructor test. And let's see here. Yeah, let's do line number three. So let's see here. Let's look at number three. So when the name is Sharon, there's two classes. Oh, a GPA is, uh, is greater than 4.0. Okay, and that everything else is valid. And so, uh, right, when we, um, when we invoke the constructor, we throw an exception saying that GPA is not within expected range. Okay, yeah, let's start there. That's kind of a wacky one. Um, that's cool. So let's see here. Uh, I will say the following. Now, the first thing I need to do is I need to write a method that is my test, and I annotate it with this at test annotation. And I'm going to say a student with GPA greater than four uh, throws invalid GPA exception. Now, as I think I said last time, oh my gosh, that's a really long method name. Um, but yes, I think it's also descriptive. And uh, uh, you know, there is no penalty really to having um, these long method names. So um, I like to go with that. Okay, so let's see here. What do I need to do? See, I need to look at my scenario. Here's here's all this stuff. I'm gonna see what I'm just trying to copy and paste this in the thing. So, oh, I've got this stuff. Okay, cool. So then uh, I'm going to. I want to create that student, so I'm going to say a new student, and uh, I'm going to say, okay, the name uh, is, sorry, sorry, I just used a keyboard shortcut uh, out of habit. I did a command P to tell me what parameters are there, and you might have noticed I have this plugin in IntelliJ that pops up the, uh, the command, uh, the, uh, the uh, description of the keyboard shortcuts that I use. Um, so, uh, you know, please pay attention to that. I find them to be useful. Um, okay, so let's see here. The name is Sharon. I want to have a new array list of the classes. Uh, okay, I guess I'll have to make that up here. Um, and I'll just call this classes. And then I'm going to have the GPA, which is 5.0, and the gender, which is female. Um, and now what I can do is, I, so, so this is highlighted in red, um, which means that, it, that IntelliJ doesn't know what it is, it doesn't compile, it tells me, okay, I cannot resolve symbol. And um, when I hover over it, it gives me this nice pop-up saying, hey, here's you know, what's wrong, here's what you can do about it. I can create a local variable called classes. That's something I want to do, so I'm just going to click on this right here. And it creates a classes variable for me of type ArrayList string, so it's smart enough to do that for me, that's very nice. Um, and I'll create a new array list there, and I will add uh, I will add Java, and I will add uh, front end. Oh, and by the way, uh, if you're like, what's an array list? Uh, check out the uh, the Java Collections um, lecture, which I think was on last week's um, a, a docket. Um, you'll be using collections a lot in the course. Um, and so that's a pretty important lecture to have, plus they're just super valuable objects. Okay, so this is my, um, this is my given right here. Uh, you know, given a student with, uh, you know, named Sharon, uh, who is taking Java and front end. Right. And uh, actually, let's just sort of do it this way. Uh, let's put it up here. 
I'm just sort of writing this so that we can keep track. Um, who is taking job on front end? Is uh, has a GPA of five point one zero and uh, has a female gender. And now I want to say, you know, when uh, a student is created, then uh, a uh, what was it, invalid GPA exception is thrown. Do I want to put GPA in all caps or do I want this? Which one do you think is better? I think that's okay. Okay. Okay, well, I've done the when right here, and that creates, but then I want to say, okay, an invalid GPA exception is thrown. So how can I do that? Actually, any ideas of how I can write a test that validates that invalid GPA exception is thrown? Well, would I do that in the test? I, like, how do I test that? How do I validate in the test that the GPA uh, exception is thrown? Well, it's not okay. You're, I like the question. Right, you're, you're, you've got uh, some good thinking, right? So, uh, what, you know, what he's suggesting is that, oh, okay, yeah, I could have a get GPA method that throws the exception. Um, but what I was thinking, and actually, kind of what the test case implies, is that it's the act of Constructing the object uh, object that throws the exception. I think that seems reasonable, right? You know, I think there's something to be said for doing validation in the constructor so that you can never create an object that is invalid. Yeah, um, yeah Amanda suggested try and catch block. That's a good idea. Yeah, so let's put this in a catch block. And we'll catch an invalid, invalid GPA exception. Oh, there's some red here because it doesn't know what an uh, uh, invalid GPA exception is. That's true. Um, and it's saying create type parameter invalid GPA exception. That's, I don't think I want a type parameter here. I want to create a class. So oops, come on, hover over it again. I can go to more actions here. Oh yeah, it says, okay, create class. Yep, I wanna do that, I wanna create a class. And it tells me what, uh, what, what directory it wants, well, it says what package, I'll keep it all in the same package. I don't wanna put invalid GPA exception in my test classes because it's really part of my main program. So I will put it here in my student main directory. I hope that was visible for everybody. And I will click okay. And now, oh, it's asking me if I wanted to add it to Git. I do. I just created a new file, and I want to put that in, in Git under uh, version control. Cool. Okay, and it's created one. Um, now, this one here. Uh, oh, I noticed that here in IntelliJ, my there's still a red underline under my student test, which probably means there's a problem. So, oh, it looks like it's a different thing it's complaining about now. It's saying that it requires a type of throwable, but instead I provided an invalid GPA exception. That is true. Invalid GPA exception at this point does not uh, extend throwable. So if you remember from the Java language lecture, we talked about exceptions and how uh, all exceptions um, derive from throwable, and then there are other subclasses uh, from that. So you, if you're going to catch something, you have to catch an exception. OK, uh, we're saying that as throwable. So um, let's see here. It'll let me say, hey, do I want to make invalid GPA extend throwable? What are some of my other options? Not much. Um, so, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll make it extend throwable, but I don't know if I really like that or not. What is it? Uh, oh, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, yeah, it's saying, okay, so now it's complaining that the exception is never thrown in the corresponding try block, which is true because 
my student class doesn't de the constructor doesn't declare that it throws invalid uh, GPA exception. Okay, well, I guess I need to do that then. But before I do that, um, yeah, no, I'll 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 do that. Um, okay, so then here I need to say that uh, Zoom windows. Uh, I need to say that this throws an invalid GPA exception. And notice I started typing and it prompts me for like, hey, did you mean invalid GPA exception? It's like, yes, yes, I did. Thank you for not making me type all of that. Uh, oh, now it's saying there's one related problem. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now my first test where I created a student doesn't compile anymore because now the constructor throws an invalid GPA exception. It's telling me that it doesn't handle it, which is true. Like, there's no try catch here. Now, I don't want to catch it. So what here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to hover over here and what I can say, add exception to method signature. Great. This is a test. So if it throws an invalid GPA exception, I don't expect that. And so I want the test to fail if, uh, if it now throws an invalid G, uh, GPA exception. What I was doing here is getting my code to compile again after I added some new code, right? I added this uh, invalid GPA exception. And because it extends throwable, uh, the exception is what's called a checked exception. We talked about it in the, in, in the language lecture. Um, and because it's a checked exception, it must be caught. So things like IO exception and in your project two, you'll see uh, a parser exception. Um, those are checked exceptions, they must be caught. Other exceptions like null pointer exception and you know, uh, array index out of bounds exception are what are called unchecked exceptions. They do not need to be caught. Okay. Well, my code is looking better now. I'm looking at my test. Um, oh, there's this yellow highlight right here. What is it saying? Empty catch block. That's probably not what I want to do there. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, this test isn't quite correct because uh, of the following. So if I am able to create a student object with a, an invalid GPA, the test ought to fail. And the way I can do that is by invoking the fail method. Um, I don't know if we found it. No, it hasn't yet. Um, it's asking me, uh, do I want to import it? The answer is yes, I do. I want to fail with a message saying, you know, should have thrown an uh, invalid uh, GPA exception. And IntelliJ is, is, is giving me a warning here saying that's empty catch block. Um, and I'll just add a comment here to start up uh, to say, uh, you yeah, know, we expect this exception. And so I think my test is done. What do you all think? Is that, is that enough? Is that something I'm missing? Okay. Well, let's go to try and see what happens. So I'm going to run this test. As my, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. It's got a bunch of all that. You know. It's on my same screen, and so I'm going to run it. Now let's see here. I think I expect everything to compile. So uh, as the first thing that IntelliJ does is compiles all the code, and then okay, this is cool. It uh, it runs it, and it says that one test failed. Um, because, aha, uh -huh, it got uh, an assertion failed error saying it should have thrown an invalid GPA exception, which is true. Oh, look at this. IntelliJ even underlines the, the place where it failed in, in this red dot. Um, so you can see this was the code that caused the test to fail, um, which is true. No, but although, but wait, wh why did this test fail? Right, I, I never modified the uh, production code to make it fail, but that's okay. This is test-driven development, right? So what we do first is we write a test that we um, that validates the expected capability, expected functionality, which in this case is when you create a student with a GPA of 5.0, you expect that an invalid GPA exception is thrown. And as a matter of, well, yeah, 
That's cool. Okay. So now, uh, so remember that Uncle Bob video that we watched with like the silly hat and everything like that? And it was the red. Well, no, we're at the red. Now we got to get it to green. And so how do we get it to green? We implement the functionality that we expect. So where do we need to implement this? Uh, where, where do we need to implement this, this capability? This error checking. It's in Java. Yep. Yeah, in the student constructor. And IntelliJ makes it really easy to go to the, the student constructor. Um, let's see here. Uh, I never use the, where is it? Uh, oh, uh, find usages. No, I want to go to, oh, there we go. go to declaration or usage. Cool. You can also do that by holding down while well, it's command on Mac or control on the Windows and just clicking on it. Uh, or it's, you know, command B. I don't know why it's good. Great, so here I am in the constructor. Okay, so what do we want to do? Ah, if GPA is greater than four, uh, or, uh, oops, or GPA is less than zero. Uh, I'm going to say that I don't want to write this code yet. I don't want to write this code because I don't have a test to validate this code. This is another ask, this is another tenant of test driven development is that you only write enough production code, enough code under test to make the test pass. And I agree with your instincts, right? It's like, you know that the code that you'll want to write eventually, but there is this discipline in TED and, and trust me, you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself. Um, that says, no, you only write code, you write the, the minimal amount of code to make the test pass. So you want to say, great, if GPA is greater than 4.0, then throw new invalid GPA exception. Okay. I'm going to run my test again, which I can do by clicking on that button down there. I can also use Control R, and it passes. Nice. This is good. Okay. Uh, I'm going to check in my code. So I've added a bunch of things. So I'm going to do that here in IntelliJ. I'm going to use the commit panel right here. Um, it tells you what, uh, what changes have been made to which files. I'm going to select them all. And I'm going to say, hey, uh, we wrote our first unit list. And I'm going to commit that and push that up to GitHub. Oh, it's telling me that there were two warnings. Yeah, they're probably both here in this file someplace. Oh, yeah, things like I don't use the parameters. Well, we'll get there eventually. So that's okay. I think I've installed a plugin or something that is a little bit more noisy about uh, warnings, but uh, you may or may not see that in yours, I'm not sure. Okay, cool. Okay, well, hey, we just ran a test. Congratulations, everybody. Uh, let's go back to our document. Let's, let's call this one done. Uh, let's just fill in the, let's see where it is. Can I, uh, how do I fill in the, Uh, where is the cell color? Is it just over here? Border color? Well, whatever. Trying to be fancy. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, where is this pin header to this row? Add another row. I should really know how to make the background color. Is that this one highlight color? No, that's not right. No, that means Anyway, forget that. Okay. Um, what's another good one? What's the next test that we should write? Thank you, Sharon. You're awesome. Ooh, number two, yeah. Oh, I, yeah, right. So, like, yeah, number two is kind of like uh, like the end to end be all. That, actually, that's that's a pretty good one to implement. Although we're not gonna get to work right away. Right, get to implement the whole thing. But yeah, actually, it's it's good. Um, I, I like doing that. I like that strategy. Um, for the, the following reason, um, because, uh, because it lets you know uh, sort of like what the end goal is. And so periodically you can run the test to see how close you are, right? So um, we'll just call it Dave student from the assignment. Let's see here. So then all of this, so I'm just going to use the thing. 
get there. Okay. So then, uh, what are we going to do? So our given, I'm not going to type all this out. I'm going to create that Dave student. So we're going to have a student called Dave, which is new student. And the name is Dave, or there are the classes. And GPA is 3.64. And then the gender is male. And oops, we're going to, uh, we're going to create a local variable called that. And we're going to make that new array list. And oh, right, it's saying unhandled exception. OK, so I'm going to go, I'm going to say add method exception to method signature like that. And now I need to populate classes. I'm going to say add algorithms and classes, add operating systems. And I'm going to say classes add Java. OK. And uh, I'm going to create that. And now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say Dave.says. And oh, I was putting the assertion statement here, I guess. I'm going to say uh, assert that Dave dot says oops. Oh, you even prompt me for it when I have slang signal. Great. Equal to this big what the result is this thing right here. Oh, there's a period on the end. And but let's see here. I need to put that in double quotes and when I paste it, I think it'll do it's smart enough to escape the uh, double quotes and all that kind of stuff. Good. This saves me so much time, right? You know, uh, you don't want to watch me typing and making all these mistakes and stuff like that. It's one of the things I like about IntelliJ is that it um, uh, it just saves a lot of work. Okay. So I think this is, uh, I'll go with that. Okay. You can tell I'm not young because I like two spaces after my period. Um, and I, so I think this is, this is right. So I think it's all implemented. I can get rid of all this stuff up here. And I'm going to run this again. We're going to run this for the first time, I guess. OK, I run it. And it says, unsupported operation exception not implemented yet. So um, what happened is I ran it. And when it invoked the says method, it threw, oh, it even like told me. Uh, it said, let's see here. Uh, it threw an unsupported operation exception saying not implemented yet. It printed out the stack trace down here, and I can click on the stack trace to then see what code that was. And, oh, yeah, sure enough, right? The says method doesn't do much of anything yet. Okay. Now, where do I go from here? Yeah, we can implement the says method. Now, that's cool. I like that. Um, is this the right test for implementing the says method? Probably not, right? Because this is doing, this is the kitchen sink. This is doing everything. So this is a great test, but we're not ready for it yet. So it's cool. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. There is uh, an annotation that comes with JUnit called disabled that I can put on this test. And um, this will basically prevent it from being run. So like I can run all of my tests here in the class um, by using uh, this run the entire student test. And what it'll do is, I'll uh, rebuild it, but now it's going to uh, run them all. And it only ran two. It said that there were two tests that passed and one was ignored. That's good to know. Actually, I think I can show ignored ones here. And by the way, I can like do things like navigate by doing uh, see the jump of source, things like that. Um, but I've disabled this one. I like using this. I'm not instead of like commenting it out. I like having the code there, so that way, if um, I change something about the code, so remember how when we added that invalid GPA exception, all of a sudden our first test didn't compile anymore because it didn't do anything with that invalid GPA exception. I kind of want that, um, I, I, and so then if I make another change, I want to know whether or not I need to update this this test, um, and so I want to leave the code compilable. Um, and so I don't want to comment on that. It's okay. Okay, well, so we're going to um, exercise, we're going to implement says next. We need to write a test for says. Um, so what is the test for says?
再让你看。Well, I mean, first of all, like the name of the test is like all students say this class is too much work. And actually, this is basically I think it's, it's what it's this one right? No, no, wait, sorry. It's, it's the first number one, right? So it doesn't matter what any of these are. Whenever says is invoked, then the result is this class is too much work. So yeah, and so sorry. And so you were saying, how, how do we go about implementing it? No, what? Shoot, I totally messed that up. That should be assert. That should be two string. That should not be says. Um, but yeah, um, so assert that. Um, actually, oh yeah, we can just we can just um, use this date screen again. Maybe if we were doing that. And then now, oh, yeah, we need to say that oh, show context action. So say add to message method And then we say, yeah, assert that uh, Dave.says equals to this class is to March. Okay. And now we'll run this. Oops. And it's failed because again, student uh, says it's unimplemented. So how do we get this pass to? How do we get this test to pass? Okay. Someone reject. Yep, implement says. That's right. And so says always returns this class is to not work. Okay, so everything compiles, we'll run this again. Great, and things pass. Again, test driven development, tiny little steps. And yeah, you know, I'm sure some of you have got this completely implemented in your head, or maybe even you're you know, playing along at home and you've got it, but that's not the point here, <laughs> right? The, you know, this is like a super easy exercise in which we're exploring test driven development. Um, and the same thing with the, the kata next week, it'll be super easy code that is used to explore pair programming. Um, and, and this is what you do, you know, but, but, but when you learn these things in an easy way, all of a sudden when you get to your projects or when you're, you know, like when we get to like the, the, the second and third pair programming katas, which are, uh, which are more complex, um, working in these small steps and writing unit tests along the way, give you confidence that things work the, the, the way that you expect, and that you haven't broken things as you make changes. Okay, nice. Okay, so we've got the says method implemented. Um, we have uh, the, the, the GPA. So let's see here. What is the next test that we should write? Okay, what aspect of two strings? I mean, there's a lot to the two string, right? I mean, gosh, it has all sorts of stuff. So, like, where is like a good place to start with exploring two string? Okay, yep, no classes. That would be one. What? What are some other options? Because let's figure it out. Figure it out. So, so where else should, could we start? No name. Okay. Well, I mean, if it's got no name, do we even create it in the first place? So if we can't create a student in the first place, can we invoke two students? So we could. We could just say, hey, if you've got like, what, null for a name or something? Okay. Okay. So basically the test would be that two string contains the number of classes. Okay. I like that. Okay. So then uh, test. Um, avoid two string contains the number of classes. Okay. Um, so then uh, we'll use my Dave student again. And uh, we'll make this. Oops. Do that. And then we will say what? Assert that Dave.toString contains string and this is a method from the hamcrest api and so then uh, i'm going to import static method from hamcrest matchers 
And let's see here. And contain string three. Yeah. Okay. Next. Okay. Well, let's run that. All right. It calls two. It fails because two string isn't implemented. Okay. Let's implement two string. Okay, and so we want to implement two string that contains the number of classes. So how do we do that? So, so we say, ah, great, we got to implement the rest of two string that has the name, things like that. Well, looking at the test, do we? Right? I mean, if two string doesn't return the name, the test is going to pass. The only thing that's important in the test is that it returns the number of classes. So, I mean, that's where you're going with this, right? So now, I mean, I'm sort of asking myself a question. Well, okay, what, what options do I have? I could implement it. I could basically, like, you know, halfway implement it. And here again, in test driven development, you do the simplest thing that could possibly work which is just print out the number of numbers or I just return a string that contains, you know, the number of, of classes. Okay, that's cool. Um, actually, the simplest thing would probably be returning the string three. That'd be a little dumb, but uh, all right. Um, or maybe we should, instead of focusing on implementing this test, we should first implement the fact that two string returns this, contains the student's name. I, I don't know which is better in this case. Honestly, I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, quite naturally, you're thinking about the implementation and how you want to implement. Of course, ultimately, when you implement it, you want the name before the uh, number of, uh, of classes. And so then maybe when it comes to testing it, you sort of test it in the order that you think you, you know, it ought to be implemented. I don't think anything wrong with that. It sounds reasonable. Um, yeah, want to do that instead? And then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll maybe come back to this test later. So I'm going to mark this test as uh, disabled because we wrote it, but we aren't going to implement it quite right yet. And instead, let's implement void to string contains uh, student name. Uh, once again, get my name student. And I'll go to the function. And then I'll say assert that Dave got two string to clean string. Uh, thank you for filling in all the blanks, IntelliJ. Um, it contains the string Dave. Okay. Now we'll run this. Well, actually, we could say. We can say contain string, but we could also say we could have a stronger test. I think if we just said, yeah, if we said um, starts with. Yeah, this is, that's a stronger test. That way, you know, you make sure it's at the beginning of the string, but there's an any place in the string. Okay. And we'll run it again so we change the test. Yep, still not implemented. Okay. Uh, so how are we going to implement it? I don't want to throw the exception anymore. So what are we going to do? Return name. Oh, I guess I guess it does know what name is. Name. What is name here? So I am going to. Oh, look at that. It's telling me that the name is a protected field from the animal class. Okay. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Let's give that a try. Actually, you know, it's a, it's a field. This is also a get name. Oh, I'm going to use get name instead. I like that. Nice. Okay. It passes now. This is good. It's been a while since I've run all of my tests, so I'm going to run all of my tests. Um, just make sure everything still works. I expect it to. Yep, nice. Look how fast that was, right? It ran whatever. We got like six tests. Now, so we ran four of them, um, and it runs nice and fast. 
So I'm thinking back to Uncle Bob. And he, right, he had the silly hat on. He was in red mode. It was in uh, green mode. And then there was the blue. Remember what the blue stood for? Refactor. Uh, anybody remember what refactoring is? Yeah, change the code around to be more efficient or overall better. And I don't think he pointed this out, but the thing that I always have to remind myself about refactoring is that refactoring shouldn't change the behavior. Okay, cool. So given that and what we've written so far, do you see opportunities for refactoring? We haven't asked the question. Are there opportunities for refactoring? Oh yeah, yeah. I create my Dave student several times. Yeah, I think that's a good opportunity for refactoring. Okay, so how do we put all of this code in one place? Okay, yeah, yeah, we could declare it globally. Um, yes, and so then how do we do that though? <laughs> Wait, because uh, it's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's like a bunch of stuff you need to initialize. Um, actually, if you may recall from the uh, from the JUnit lecture, JUnit has a way to do this, um, which is uh, you can have a method which is annotated with at uh, at before um, before each, and then we will say uh, create Dave students. And so, okay, what we will do is. I'm just going to create, let's see here, I'm going to, I want all this code, and so I'm just going to remove it from here, and I'm going to put it up here, and now Dave is a local variable here, and it's telling me it's like you never use it, which is true, and so I think I want it to be a field instead in this class, and it's, it's probably complaining it doesn't exist, well that's fine, I'll create the field. Nice. Oh, and yep, I got to handle the exception. Okay. This is neat. Okay, so now I've got my student Dave. I've got... Uh, now I want to go through and look for all that duplicate code and... Uh, oh, look at this. This is now grayed out because that is true. This code doesn't throw the invalid GPA exception anymore. Well, I like that. I'm just going to remove that from the throws list. All right. This is the thing that you do when you refactor, right? There's almost we had to add, and now we move things around, and now we clean it up, but it doesn't change the, um, the functionality. So let's see here. I don't need this code anymore. And oh my gosh, just feels so good. Just get rid of the code. And right? And it's like so much easier to understand now. Um, oh yeah, here's one more place. Okay, great. Look at that. Right? You don't get paid by the line of code, <laughs> you get paid by the problems that you solve. Um, and so then, yeah, let's, you know, let's get rid of this thing. I'm going to do that. Let's either remove, and then remove, remove, sweet. And IntelliJ up here, you probably didn't notice it. When, when it was still those warnings, it had some yellow up here. That's the green check mark, which means no problems found. Nice. Okay, well, clean this up a lot. Let's rerun all of my tests again, just make sure everything passed. Nice. Good, everything still passed. Okay, let's. Uh, Let's see here. Um, now we're, we, oh, sorry, I just used a keyboard shortcut to commit all that code. And I'm going to say, I mean, really, what did we test? We're now testing that, oh yeah, um, all students say the same thing. And uh, the student two string returns the student string. Okay. Let me push those up. And it's still the same one. Okay. Now, okay, uh, let's see here. Where to next? Want to keep exploring two string? I mean, honestly, I think that's like the bulk of the functionality is this two string, by the way. Which number part? Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. So let, yeah, let, let's see here. Let's let's do the next part of it then. Yeah, because here again, it, it's okay to you know implement the t to write the test in the order in which you think they're implemented. So yeah, let's do the next thing of having um, that the two string contains has a GPA of. Okay, nice. Okay, and uh, let's see here. Okay, so then yeah, let's just do void two string contains GPA. And then so we're gonna assert that we've got two string contains string uh so what was that has a GPA of has a GPA of where do we have the GPA of three point six four or something? Yep, three point six four. Let's explore. Okay, let's run this test. Okay, ah, look at this, look, look at this failure. Okay, it's saying that I expected a string that contains, a string containing has a GPA of 3.64, which is exactly what I said it, you know, it ought to be. But instead, all I got was the string Dave, which does not contain the string, has GPA of 3.64. Okay. So what do you do? What are we going to do? Okay. Yeah. Has a, has a, has a GPA of, of what? Get GPA. Okay, we know this method. That's cool. Okay, so I'm going to create that method, which I can do in Intelligible. Oops, over over it, and it says create method get GPA in student. Uh, what do I want get GPA to return? Uh, sorry, what type of data do I want it to return? Uh, yeah, it was double. Yeah, it was double. Okay, cool. Okay, and so then what do I return here? Oh yeah, right. Uh, it's like there isn't a thing. So we want to have uh, because it's an instance method. I guess we'll need an instance field called this dot GPA. Ooh, good question. Are we writing code that we haven't written a test for? Say more. That's a good point. Yeah. Do we need to write a test for getting the GPA? Um. What do you all think? Mm Yeah, I mean, you raised some good points. Like, hey, we've got a get name method. You know, we didn't write. Uh, actually, we did write a test for that. Actually, we did write a test for that. Yeah, um, for that uh, first uh, student. Um, but you also pointed out that it's like, well, I mean, shoot, if if the only place we're calling get GPA is in the two string method, and if it tests the two string method, we're really just testing that. And it also pointed to the fact that it's a private method. So we have a lot of control over where it's invoked. Um, the meaning is only invoked from inside this class. Uh, I would even say that we probably don't need to get GPA. Right? What if we're going to call it? Right? I mean, it's like, what if we're going to call it? I don't know if we need it right now. And so, yeah. So, uh, I don't know. We'll leave it there for the time being. But I, don't, I think we're okay not testing it. But it's a good conversation, right? Because like, you know, I, I think it's a really good instinct to ask yourself, like, oh, do we test this or not? I'm writing code and, uh, hey, if I'm following this under development, it's like, well, you know, am I writing code that isn't being tested? I think the answer is, well, we're not right now, but we run the risk of it. So I'm glad you're thinking about it. Okay, so let's see here. Here is another field that doesn't exist. So we can create the field GPA and student, so we'll make it a double. Okay. And uh, let's see here. This compiles and student test compiles. Let's run it again. What do you think is going to happen? 
Ça passe Ça va Perfect. What did it fail? It said, okay, expected a string containing GPA, has a GPA of 3.64, but was Dave has a GPA of zero. No. Yeah. Okay, why was that? Ah, okay. So the constructor, right, we, and actually, you know, IntelliJ was kind of give us a clue here, because when we create this field, it's grayed out saying, oh yeah, private field GPA is never assigned. Ah, okay. Thank you. So, okay. Here we are in, uh, yeah, we pass in the GPA in the constructor, and other than checking to make sure that it's greater than 4.0, we don't do anything with it. So, uh, let's, yeah, let's just say here, if we get down here, we'll say this.gpa equals GPA. Hmm, here. Run it one more time. Cool. Okay. Nice. Uh, let's do one more test. Um, let's see. Actually, uh, two string. Go ahead and uh, oops. Yep, small. Okay. Uh, what next? Hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. We haven't even um, began to uh, test the uh, yeah the, the gender and what's uh, what's valid there. So. Um, yeah. Okay. How can we test that? Like, what is the? I oh, actually we've got something here. Um, with like, okay, here's like. Oh, great! This is saying, hey, when you invoke two string with an invalid gender, uh, I guess it's like, yeah, throwing an exception or or something like that. Um, you know, we probably want to validate. We probably want to validate the constructor, right? Like we did the GPA. Uh, you know, again, it's like, you, you know, one of the things, one of the decisions you need to make when you are designing your, uh, you know, your object is, can you tolerate or do you want to tolerate an, an object which is in an invalid state? And most of the time you don't. So then put the safeguards in the constructor so you can't create it in the first place. Um, or then, you know, you have to write your code to be resilient the fact that it might be in a, in a, in a bad state. Yeah. yeah, we could do that. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, you know what, we talked about implementing the, you know, it is taking three classes, but I think we know how to do that, right? So, yeah, let's do something a little bit more interesting. Okay, so then uh, let's see here. Well, let's just do, uh, let's do a, a null gender. So, like, what happens? What, what, what should be... Let's see here. Um, uh, null gender does what? Throws, yeah, what kind of exception? I guess we want another like invalid gender. Other than the terminology, you know, the naming's hard, right? And it's like, let me invalidate anybody's gender, but. Well, again, for the sake of, uh, you know, if, if someone's got a better name, I'm way open to it. Um, okay, cool. So let, let, well, let's let's do that same pattern again. So uh, let's see here. Well, we'll, we'll create a new student. Um, uh, the name will be you know, whatever, and then classes, and the GPA is only acceptable at one dot two three. Now we'll just say. Five and then the gender is null. Okay, and okay, so we will do that. Classes, it's new array list, and then we'll. Well, actually, that is valid. So, so actually, I don't even need a variable there. All we're going to do is have it empty. So what I can do is I can. 
I want to show you refactoring intelligent because it makes it so much easier. So I can right click on the variable and I can say refactor and I can say inline variable. And what this will do is it'll take the variable declaration with the value of the variable and then replace the usage of it, replace its usage of it with this new array list. So refactor, actually, sorry, I'll do this so you can see it better. I'll do it in the menu up here. I'll say refactor, inline variable, poof. And now the, oh, and I don't need this anymore. And so now I can replace with the diamond operator. Nice. Anyway, uh, I, um, I use the refactorings in IntelliJ all the time. It saves me a lot of time, but it's probably a little too much for day one. But I wanted to show you what, what's possible. Okay. Um, here I'm creating a student with no gender. And so then this thing is then it's going to catch and invalid gender exception. And let's see here. Uh, oh, I need to add in. Oh, interesting. Uh, let's see here. I do not want to handle any invalid GPA exception. I just want to add it up there because it's, I don't expect it. And then uh, we expect this. And uh, now I want to create this class. And by the way, on the Mac, it's option uh, enter. And that brings up this menu here that lets you quickly do things like create an invalid gender class. And uh, then it's, uh, then I want to make it throwable. Yes, thank you very much. And then it's complaining that it's never thrown. Yep. And so right, we're doing this again. We did it a few minutes ago. We now need to add it to the, uh, the constructor, something that's thrown there. Make sure it's a little easier to read. Um, and I can also throw an invalid, oops, uh, does that. Should be done there. Oh, you know what? This isn't working because I went too fast. I created invalid gender in the wrong directory. And this ends up being, and I, I'll figure this out of the way. This is in my test directory and it needs to be in the uh, source directory so that student can see it because student is in the source directory. No problem. Um, I will, uh, I will, I'm sorry, I have a keyboard shortcut, it's all F1, for me to see it in project view. So we're going to open up the project. So we're going to open up the project view over here. And I basically want to move this guy over here to the source main. I'm just going to click and drag, move it to that package. It is prompting me to make sure I want to move that package in the source main. Yes, move all that other stuff. And oh, now my student is happy, my student compiled because it has a known invalid gender. It's saying there are some problems and it's gonna tell me the problems like this one right here and there. And oh yeah, look, I'm creating a student. It is not, uh, they're not handling the exception anymore. Yep. And so I'm just gonna say, add that to method signature. And this is the same thing here. Yep, add it to the method signature. It saves you a lot of typing. Um, this one I want to add to the method signature. Yeah. Right there. Cool. Ooh, I changed a lot of things. So let's see here. I am done with this test, though. No, I'm not, because I need to have a fail statement. Um, oh, actually, you know what? So, no, no, I'm going to do it. So, I'm going to pretend I didn't remember that. I'm going to run this. And now I should expect it to fail because I haven't implemented it. But if I run it, I think it'll pass. And that's not what I want. Remember, in test-driven development, you always start with a failing test. Because if I was like, okay, well, you know, if I didn't run it, if I immediately just wrote the test and I thought it was good enough and I wrote the implementation, then it wouldn't, uh, then I wouldn't really be, because there, there was a bug in the test, right? This test doesn't fail um, when the exception is not thrown. So if we get to this line of code, we want to say, you know, should have thrown an invalid exception. And now when I run it again, it fails like it ought to. And again, 
you want to see it uh, fail, then we will make it uh, we'll make a pass. How do we make a pass? We'll throw the exception from the uh, from the constructor. So we say if gender is null, then throw new invalid gender exception. Okay, and it passed. Cool. Okay. Now, since we made so many changes, I do want to go back and like rerun all of my tests. If everything should either pass or be ignored, oh, good, and it is. Okay. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to commit that. Um, and I think this is a, a good stopping point for now. Um, but what do you think? So, uh, this is unit testing, and this is test driven development. Um, so, uh, begin to um, validate. Um, so, you know, I, I hope what you saw is that, you know, you work in small bytes, right? We have this big two string, there's all sorts of things. And while it's great to implement that one test that validates everything, when it comes to adding the code, you want to work in smaller bytes, because otherwise, you know, it, it would you just write a lot of things that validated until you get to the end. So you want to work, work in small bytes, you want to start with a failing test, see it fail, do as, as little work as possible and resist the urge to do more than that to make it pass, look for opportunities for refactoring, and watch them repeat. So that, in a nutshell, is tester and development, and the unit testing is all about working with the, the, the code under test, in this case, our simple student class and invoking its constructor, invoking methods like says and two string and validating and doing the right thing. Thoughts, questions, observations? Yeah, I, I think, think it is fun. And for me, the fun comes from those you know, little steps. Um, and, and not the, you know, like, I'm oh, about to use a sports analogy. I'm terrible at sports analogy. He's throwing the ball all the way down the field. Anyway, um, it, it, it's like uh, just you know gradually getting there a little bit of time, and at every step of the way, you have these tests to tell you that things still work as you expect, and that is so powerful because that gives you the confidence to go fast, and you know very quickly if you've broken something, which then actually in a lot, some ways allows you to make a riskier change because uh, you can always back it out if you don't if you don't like it. Cool. Okay, time for a break. So uh, let's take uh, 10 minutes, a little after 8 o'clock. We'll come back, and then we'll look at um, integration tests of the command line, and we'll see how to write, um, oh, sorry, integration tests for your main method. We'll see how to write tests that do that. Okay, and we're back. Okay, so... Uh, tonight, we have brainstormed a bunch of use cases for, um, or uh, scenarios, we'll call them that way, behavioral scenarios, for, um, for our student class. And uh, we just saw how we could implement unit tests for the student constructor and the says and the two string method that, um, uh, that, that, that exercise, that, that, that codify, that implement these uh, these scenarios that we uh, that, that we came up with and yet we got through a couple of them and there's plenty more to go but uh, I hope that sort of gave you an idea of uh, how to unit test and how to do test from development um, you know how to start from um, some ideas of what you want to do and some English descriptions of the conditions that you expect uh, to occur when you provide a certain you know inputs to the to the code um, and you know, and then what you end up with is the suite of tests that validates that yes, your uh, you know, yes, your code does what you want it to do, which is ultimately you know our goal as software engineers, and particularly for you as students, making sure that your uh, you know your code meets the requirements of the assignment, so that uh, you know you the grade. So um, uh, we we looked at the. Uh, scenarios for the class, the student class, and now I want to look at the scenarios that we came up with um, for the student command line program. 
So uh, even though you know the underlying behavior is still kind of the same, there are some different. Um, uh, there's you know, it's expressed differently. So here, instead of the inputs being you know uh, arguments past the constructor, and instead of the outputs being the uh, the thing returned, the string returned by the two string method, now we're dealing with well the, the command line program. So you're passing arguments on the command line, and you expect that certain text will be written to standard output or standard error. Okay. Now, this is important behavior, right? A big part of this student program, a big part of your assignments is the command line. That's actually, I mean, how, uh, how the program will be evaluated. Not so much, you know, how well the, uh, the, 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 the appointment class, or the appointment book class um, behaves, but really how well the, the main method um, behaves. That's the code that's really under test. And so, therefore, it's really important to be able to test your main method, but, as I said, the main method, uh, or rather, you know, the command line argument deals with the command line program, deals with command line arguments and standard output and standard error. And so, how do you test that? And, and this was, uh, you know, a problem that I, uh, a question I considered when um, I, uh, you know, as I introduced um, uh, testing to the course. Um, it's not just writing the code; it is testing and validating the code. So, so. Um, Oh, sorry, one more thing. And so because you are testing different aspects of your code, you're testing, again, the command line, the main method that interacts with things like standard up and standard error, you need a different kind of test. Now, uh, what we saw um, in the, previously were unit tests. You are working directly with you know, one little piece of code. It's uh, just the constructor. You know, we look at our student class, there's really not all that much there. And even when it's fully implemented, there's not all that much there. However, as tests, um, but, but, but you can also have tests that uh, exercise um, multiple objects working together, multiple classes, lots and lots of code. Um, and you might also have uh, tests that uh, operate on multiple systems interacting. Uh, when you get to project five, you'll be working with this client server where you've got a web server that hosts a REST API and you've got a Java client that goes and communicates with it. Um, and, you know, this is kind of big stuff to be able to test, but you want to still be able to test it because, I mean, that's the functionality that you provide. So in addition to unit tests, there are these things called integration tests. And integration tests, well, tests can be integration between multiple things. Um, here in project one, we're going to start with very simple integration tests, which exercise the main method. So the, um, if we look over in the project view, right, we were familiar with our student test and our, here's our main code that has our student class and then our exceptions that we added. There's this other directory under source called IT, and that stands for integration test. And in here, we have a, a class called Student IT, which stands for Integration Test. And uh, I wrote a, a little helper framework, which is uh, encapsulated in this invoke main test case um, class. So this is a class that I wrote that uh, your code depends on. And what invoke main test case allows you to do is uh, invoke the main method and more importantly, capture output, you capture text that is written to standard output and standard error. Because that's what you need to validate in these integration tests, right? If you're going to implement, you know, one of these, uh, one of these tests, you need to invoke the main method, you need to provide the command line arguments, and then you need to um, get, in the, get the data, that, get the text that is written to standard output and standard error. Yeah. And so I provided that, and so that makes it, so all you, all you need to do um, is to uh, is write tests that validate this. And these tests, and the, the, uh, the invoke main test case and the associated invoke main method is meant to be compatible with, you know, JUnit and Hamcrest, and so you can use those same APIs you're used to. So here is an example of an integration test. It basically says, hey, invoking the main method with no arguments um, prints missing arguments to st and prints the string missing arguments to uh, standard error. And here's how you implement that. Um, you use this invoke main method and you pass it the class that you want to invoke. So in this case, it's called student.class. Now, 
well, we don't go into much details, but I think you'll see it in the cones that there is this notion of a meta class associated with class, blah, 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 cool stuff. I get all excited about it. I should just focus and tell you what you need to know for tonight is that the way you invoke a main method of, uh, of a class is by saying invoke main and then give it student.class. We invoke it with zero arguments because actually invoke main also has a variable length uh, or, or of our args of the strings that get passed to main. Um, but in this case, we don't pass any in. So when you pass zero in um, uh, to, uh, to the main method of, uh, of, of student, this returns uh, an object of type main method result. And main method result, I'm going to navigate to the code here by going to go to declaration. This is my code. Um, and uh, there's probably more implementation than I wanted you to see. Um, main method result. Uh, sorry, let me just tell you what it does. Uh, sorry, I don't like to give the code. The, the implementation is a little too much. It has methods like get text, get text written to standard output, which returns a string that contains all of the text that has been written to standard output. So basically what this whole invoke main um, framework mechanism does is that it will allow your code to still write to system.out, but instead of writing it to the actual console, it writes it to a string that then is then returned and captured, if you will, by this main method result. Bottom line is that, uh, sorry, I'll take this big enough to see, is that uh, you can write code like this, where uh, you say, hey, invoke me with no arguments, and now you can get the text that was written with standard error and validate that it contains a string missing command line arguments. So we'll run that, and we'll see it pass. Because if you look at the main method of the student class, What does it do? It calls system.error.println missing command line arguments. So what this allows you to do is test that your main method is correctly writing to standard output and standard error. Okay. So given that, given that we have a uh, sorry, um, you know, given that we have this uh, this framework for writing integration tests. Um, that exercise the command line or the command line main method. Where should we start writing tests for our main method? Knowing that there's some validation and some functionality that's there in the student class that we may or may not need to retest again with the, um, with the command line uh, with, with the integration test. What would be a good first test of our main method? Sorry, what? Uh, some on the next page. Oh, th this is the yeah, this is the uh, this is the command line. Yep, no problem. But we look a lot alike. Uh, yeah, I think it's the one we have right now. Right. So when there's no command line arguments, you get this command line argument. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we'll start with, okay, uh, invalid GPA. Okay, yeah, I like that. Okay, so let's see here. We'll just call this one, oops, let's do that. Call that right there. Sorry. Um, yeah, okay, so let's see here. Uh, invalid, yeah, okay. invalid GPA does what exactly? Uh, prints error to standard error, okay. Okay, so we need to put together our command line. So here we're gonna say, um, oh, I'm just gonna copy this code, it's easier. Let's start. 
So here we want to invoke main and what are the command line arguments we want to do? I just put them on the clipboard, didn't I? No, I didn't because I copied something else. Okay. Okay, nice. Okay, so here, um, well, actually, let's see here if I paste this again. Yeah, let's, let's paste this again here. Well, I can do that easily enough. I can say uh, Dave, and then email, and then here's the bad GPA, 3.46, and then I'll say algorithms and uh, operating systems in uh, Java. That's how it seems to compile. And then, yeah, okay, assert that it contains the string, what is it going to be? Invalid GPA data type. Okay. So shoot it in. Invalid GPA data type. Okay, don't need that comma anymore. Run this. Okay, it failed surprisingly because it, it, uh, it contained invalid GPA data type and instead was missing command line arguments. Okay. Okay, where do we go from here? Um, in the constructor? Well, I think we can start with the main method, right? So, okay. Uh, oh, someone they're waiting in the chat. Yes, parsing the command line arguments. Yeah. Oh boy, right? And this is what you need to do in the main method is parse those command line arguments. So, okay. Let's, uh, I don't know. How do you want to do that? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, well, in Java, you don't use get opt, you use um, the, the command line arguments are passed in as a string array to the main method. So you've got them. And so now we just need to, you know, figure out what to do. And actually, do I still have my, it's, I don't remember what order the command line arguments come in. Um, not very good at the answer. Okay, so the first one is the name. Okay, so I don't know, I'll just do, oops, uh, string name. The student name is going to be args. Well, you know, actually, we don't even need that. That might be a little overkill. Um, let's see here, the 0, 1, 2, second, you know, the, the, the uh, argument number 2 will be the, uh, oops, will be that. Okay, so that gives the GPA string, and how do we test whether or not it's a valid double? Yeah, like um, like A two I or something like that, and C plus plus whatever it's called. Um, yeah, 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 in our way to try to cast to a double. Yeah, let's, let's try that. So double uh, GPA equals string, uh, oh, sorry, string casting to a double of uh, GPA string. Yeah, the compiler doesn't really like that. Let's see, in convertible types. No. Okay, um, it, this was a detail that was in the, um, in the language lecture, I think. Um, there is a static method of double called uh, parse double, and we'll send in a GPA string. That's cool. Okay, so that's the GPA. Uh, let's see what happens. Oh, oh, okay. Look what happened here. So I went and ran it. And it failed, obviously. It got an exception. It said there was an uncaught exception in main and saying, oh, yeah, main methods should not throw exceptions, which is true. Um, the test harness doesn't allow your main methods to um, throw exceptions. And, uh, oh, and Nora's way ahead of me. Right. You get What you get is a number format exception here on line 69 of main. Let's see here. It's, oh, I didn't underline it. 
Uh, but here we are on line sixty nine. Yes, it was. It tried. Yeah, it said red three point uh, six four, and said got number four max seconds. So yeah, you got it. so let's um, let's catch that exception. Okay, and catch a number format exception. And what are you, you going to do if there's a number format exception? Right, print the error message. And what was the, yeah, what was that uh, invalid GPA data type? Okay, system.a.println invalid GPA data type. Yay, passes. Okay. Now, I'm guessing that most of you probably looked at what we did there. It's like, oh my gosh, that's like not even close to being done. Oh, that, that's messy. It's going to blow up. Yes, it is. And that's kind of the whole point <laughs> where it's like you just do enough so that it works. But you have a test so that as you add more things, you just run the test to make sure you have broken things. Okay. This is cool. Uh, but yeah, this is okay. So then, yeah, I think this is like our first integration test. So you see, we run this invoke main, we send it command line arguments. And uh, we get that. As a matter of fact, you know what I, I want to do? I'm going to break out of um, uh, IntelliJ. And I want to run it from the command line just to, uh, let's see, the student project. Yeah. Just to, um, oops, uh, just, just so I can show you like how it works you know, when you revoke it from the command line. Because ultimately, when I test your, when I test your projects, I have a shell script that you know invokes Java invokes the main method through by running the Java virtual machine. I don't run it through IntelliJ here. So oh and, you know, and by the way, when I run Maven Verify, it uh, it runs all the unit tests, it runs all of the, uh, the integration tests. Oh, something failed. Oh yeah. No. Because, why did it fail? It's probably the other test that failed. This one, did I break this one? I bet it did. No, oh, this one fails now because it got an array index out of bounds exception. That is true. Because this method doesn't pass in any arguments. So then args it has a length of zero. If I go to get uh, item two in it, I get an array index out of bounds exception. What should I do? Oh, like change the test? Oh, yeah. no, that, that, that seems to work. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, check the size of the args array. Yeah, I kind of like that. So, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move this code up here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say if args.length equals zero. Now I'm going to print that. Oh, and I need to return for the method and not do anything else. Let's give that a try. See, my unit test found a bug. Right, I, 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 you know, I so I wasn't thinking, and uh, and and so, and something broke. But look, I got you know, I found I, I found out about the bug before I committed GitHub. I found out about the bug within what a minute or two. Like just me blabbing on here. Imagine how fast or faster I'd go if my mouth wasn't running. Right. So it's like um, this is the power to me in my my, my mind of of unit tests. I'll just or of, of of automated tests. I want both of them. Now, because I mean, look, in a matter of you know seconds, not even right, eighty-one milliseconds, um, I was able to find out that good. Now everything works again. So okay, I'm gonna run. Uh, I'm gonna run things over here. Um, not surprisingly, when I run like build everything through uh, Maven, it takes a little bit longer. But you know, here it is running. The, uh, here's it is running the unit tests, and it's happy with that. Let's go into Java docs, everything like that. This is what the projects do. And now it's running the, um, 
good. It's running the, uh, the integration test. Everything passes. And so now, uh, now when I run Java dash jar target, it's called student net one zero. Um, I run with zero command line arguments. That's missing command line arguments. And now when I run it with uh, oh, the whole the, oh, this thing okay. Now I run it with all these. I'll have to adjust things. Just bang things. Get all these commas. I think it should be okay. Otherwise, yeah, it should be okay. You don't have to put quotes there. I'm just doing it for efficiency. I get invalid GPA data type. Yay! So you know, here I'm just validating on when I run it for for realsies with Java dash jar that yes, it behaves the same. But the nice thing, the thing that I like is that when I write the integration test, it's a lot faster, right? I didn't need to go through and do all the maven stuff. Cool. Uh, while I'm taking this in, any questions do people have? Great, great question, yeah, yes. So, um, unit test is for like the implementation of your classes. Integration tests are for the main method, the things the main method does, which is interact with standard output and standard error. Yep. Now, of course, you know, your integration tests will exercise some parts of your classes, right? You know, ultimately, you want your main method to you know, create a student instance and invoke its two-string method. Or in the case of your projects, ultimately you want your main method to create an appointment uh, uh, appointment object and add it to the appointment book, right? Um, but uh, you know, in general, but, but but there might be certain conditions that you can only test with unit test. Um, and then certainly when it comes to interacting with standard output and standard error, there are certain certain conditions that you can only test in the integration test. Good questions. Okay. What is the next integration test that we should write? Oh, number eight. Okay. Yeah, I like that. So let's see here. Um, so let's see here. Boy, missing GPA argument prints error to center there. Um, and so then. Here. And what we should say, missing GPA or something, or whatever we say, uh, GPA required. Okay, now let's run this one. Okay, not surprisingly, false flat on its face. Oh, again, an array index out of bounds exception. Okay. Cool. Uh, so let's go back to our main method. Okay, so how should we implement this? I don't know how to do this. Arts at length equals two. If you've only got two arguments, then system dot a dot line. I don't know what's it called, missing GPA or something. Oops. Well, I really want to see what that, that someone on Zoom. Make sure we get at least three args on the command line. Yep. Yeah. And so then I think this sort of does it. And then do that. Oh, right, that's the return. Okay. That works. 
Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, right. So then, okay, all those tests still work. Yeah, so actually, yeah. So let's 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 see if we can refactor some of this. Because yeah, I mean, like all these if statements. Because yeah, and I'm sure some of you are probably thinking, well, wait a second, what about missing gender? Does that mean that we have to say if args, you know, dot length equals one? And uh, I don't know. Yeah, here, here, here's what I want to do, I think. Um, so yeah, how about, let's see here. Let, let's also uh, implement, let's do another test, which is um, missing gender. And um, so I think that'll help us see a little bit more of the implementation and maybe we can factor it. And I, do we have a, uh, oh yeah, missing, oh, this is an interesting one. We'll come back to number five later. Okay. Yeah, so we'll just do, uh, so GPA required, or we'll do uh, gender required. And then we'll run this one. Oh, that's interesting. Sure. You know, we expected gender required, but then we got GPA required because I just fell through to the um, fell through the, through the looper. Okay. So uh, args dot length equals one. Then what was this? This one got the front one. Uh, oops. Don't quotes. And then So, you know, ultimately, this is this is working. And you know what? It's okay. Oops, it's not working. But was GPA required? Oh, because, you know what? My, my test was wrong. Yeah. I do this all the time. I go, go a little too fast, and I'm paying attention to my, the problem with my test, as opposed to the problem with the test. Okay, good. And then let's run everybody. Cool. Okay. Uh, wait a second, that do all, that's not do all three. We have to do all the tests. Cool, all the tests. Are okay, yeah, and so like, you know, I'm thinking about this code because ultimately I, I kind of don't want, I want to do it, a I want to parse the command line a little bit differently. Um, and so I've got a refactoring in mind. I don't know. Uh, I could do that, but we could also write some more tests. But actually, you know what? We're, we're getting to the point where, like, ultimately, what we want is to print the two string of the uh, of the student that's created. And we really we're, we're kind of doing some command line, some yeah, argument validation. But we're we're I guess we got the GPA, but we're not quite to the point where we can create. A, uh, a student object yet. You know, and that might be okay. Maybe we can get there after some more testing. Oh, yeah, you know what? Okay, so here's an interesting test that, so, you know, kind of the, the one that I'd like to, like to, uh, to, to, to write is basically this test, but with a, with a, um, a, 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 sorry, an invalid GPA in that it is out of bounds. So like, um, like here's what I mean. Like I wanna have, uh, oh, oh, oh I that later. Um, what I want now is I want, you know, a GPA that's too high. Um, so like GPA greater than 4.0. I'm sorry, I'm not to GPA greater than four. Right, because um, male and then five male. And then this should be, you know, say, uh, invalid. 
TT on the other side of that thing. Because otherwise, so I think this is going to pass right now. You don't actually create a. Uh... Oh, yeah, right. Basically saying, hey, I was expecting something to be written to standard error, but nothing was written to standard error. So, you know, ultimately, I think I want to start constructing my, my student object. So I'm going to, I'm going to do the following. I want the GPA to be initialized. I want the GPA variable outside of this block. I want double GPA. And uh, if it's invalid, bring me, I want, oh, I want to return here. It's invalid, and I think I'm going to move this string down a line. There, because I don't need it yet. Okay, and now I'm going to. I want to create my new student. I want to say new student, and you know I don't. I don't have the name yet. But let's just have some placeholders in there, and we'll just create an empty array list. And, and I think this is okay, right? You know, uh, we need, we sort of need this stuff to get it there, and the gender also. Um, let's see here. Is that? I think that'll be that'll be valid. Because ultimately, I want to, I want to do the following. I want to say, hey, listen, if the GPA is too big, what's going to happen? Well, an exception is going to be thrown. So I need to catch some exceptions. So I'm going to surround this with a try catch block. And ooh, I like what it does by default. By default, it populates those catch blocks with rethrowing the exception, which I think I think is a really good thing to do right now. Because like if I get an invalid gender exception. I'm not, I don't have a test for that, so I'm not ready to really implement it yet, but because it's a checked exception, I have to catch it. Or I suppose I could rethrow it. Maybe I'll do that instead. And basically I'll say rethrow it. Or, or I'll add to the, the, the method signature up here. Okay, and so now if I get an invalid GPA um, system.error.println uh, now, what was the error message I wanted to do in valid GPA? And then I'll return for good measure. Yeah, it says it ended here. Nice, and now it passed. Okay, here's what I wanted to demonstrate, and this is why I think it's important. So what we're doing here is when we wrote the student constructor, we conveyed the fact that there was a problem with the uh, we, can, we conveyed the fact that there was a problem with the GPA via an exception. And so in your main method, your main method should not throw exceptions because then it just, the stack just spills over in the command line. That's a really bad user experience. So instead what we do is here in the main method, we catch the invalid GPA exception and then issue, you know, one of the more, you know, human readable, graceful errors, you know, whatever it is I, I call it. So this is like a, a good, for, for me, this sort of reinforces the fact that your main method is uh, your main method does different things than the rest of your code, um, and in particular with exceptions, exceptions are great for sort of the inside, the guts of your code. But when it gets to the outermost shell of your code, things like the main method, that's where you should really only interact with system dot out and system dot error. Okay, cool. Um, so. Is, is this part of the testing making sense? You know, integration tests is, is, is different from unit tests um, because, you know, you're dealing with like the little framework that I wrote and everything like that. But are you starting to see how you can leverage this to test your main method? Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm really curious to see what your experiences are like um, doing these, uh, working with integration tests and working with unit tests. Okay, yeah, let's complain about some things. But um, there's one more thing I wanted to show you on the command line, and um, and that was, as you'll recall, in we were talking about at the very beginning of class in the how to test your projects. I talk about the code coverage. Right, important part, you know, up to one point of your grade is determined by your code coverage, and the requirement is that at least 75% of the JVM instructions are, um, are, 
are covered by a unit test. So I've written uh, unit tests. I've run sorry, covered by an automated test unit or um, or uh, integration. So um, I want to see how I'm doing. So I'm going to run Maven W uh, with the dash p greater clean verify. And what this is going to do is that it will uh, well it'll build all my code and everything. But when it runs the automated test, when it runs the unit test, when it runs the integration test, it's going to run it with code coverage, and it'll um, tell me if there is less than 75% code coverage. So let's see here. Oh, good. And it said all, co all coverage checks have been met. That's what you want to see. Um, so down here at the bottom, there's the Jococo Maven plugin. And what I'll look for is this little uh, you know, uh, message here. Um, I'm kind of curious how close I got. So uh, one of the things that Jacoco gives you is in the uh, sorry in the site directory Jacoco, and if you look at the index.html file, this tells me how close I close got. Okay, great. I got um, eighty six percent of the instructions, so I'm at eighty six percent. And you can drill into this. And it will tell you what lines are and are not covered. So all these ones in green are covered by some test. Now, again, this isn't surprising because uh, I'm doing test under development. And remember, I only write the code under test. I only write main code. Sorry, code in like the main module, the main directory, um, when I have a test for it. So uh, yeah, you can, and I can remember like, oh yeah, I wrote a test for that. I wrote a test for that. It's funny it's saying that that the new student isn't invoked, but this is why I don't go for 100% code coverage because sometimes Jacobo gets a little bit wrong. But cool. Anyway, and so then all of this is visible inside this uh, this report in Maven. Um, I talk more about it there. So that's super cool. Okay. Um, it's getting late. It's almost nine o'clock. Questions. How, how are you feeling? Do you, you have a better idea of how you're going to approach your project one uh, or any burning questions that if we got them answered tonight, you know, you would sleep better and uh, be more ready to engage in the class. Oh, excellent. Excellent question. Uh, should we start with unit tests? Should we start with integration tests? Where you go? Um, personally, I usually start with unit tests because I don't know, it seems a little easier. Yeah, you know what um, There can also be an advantage of um, if you start with the integration tests, it will give you a better idea of which unit tests you need to write. So, um, you know, I think a completely valid approach, and actually one that I'd be curious to, to know what your experiences are with, is to say, hey, I'm going to, like, like, like I, and actually, I encourage you, uh, if, if, like, the exercise we did with the Google Doc, like, worked for you, if you're like, wow, that helped me think about the project and stuff, go ahead and do that, right? You know, put out your given when thens and things like that. Um, it might be that, uh, you know, if you, especially for project one, because let's face it, the majority of the the logic is the command line parsing. That's the main method that is best um, tested with uh, an integration test. Yeah, it might make sense to do it that way because there's not a lot of logic in the in the classes, and so you get your code covered better that way because the code is covered. Alternatively, I suppose I'm thinking out loud here. You know, depending on how you want to factor your code, you could probably write most of your command line parsing in a method that isn't main. You know, passing the array and then I don't know, target. I don't know. Um, but I think either way is is fine for these projects, especially since there's so much in the the main method for later projects. And as a matter of fact, for in I don't know, like four weeks, we'll be talking about the um, project five, which is the web application. And there, we're gonna like we 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 we, uh, we turn off the dial on the testing in that project because. Um, you're able to test both. Um, well, uh, uh, I want you to come back for it. I don't want you to get scared off because it's, it's super cool stuff. You'll, you'll you'll be doing some really you know advanced testing there. 
Um, but yeah, so I guess to answer your question, you know, either way is fine. And so then if it makes more sense to start with the integration test, go for it. But what we'll probably find pretty quickly is that you'll be writing, you know, um, code in your classes, which you can write a unit test for more easily. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I think this is a good stopping point, but I do want to point out that uh, here live, you know, tonight, I did not talk about all these handouts. Instead, I have a, a screencast I put together over the weekend. It's almost an hour. Um, I did not want to spend almost an hour tonight. I would be here pretty late um, with me talking about all these things. So um, it covers the how to test your projects, how to document your projects, and the assignments for projects two and three. Um, if you haven't already, please watch that video you know, tomorrow when you're fresh or, hey, later tonight if you're super caffeinated or whatever, um, or if you work well in the middle of the night, um, and ask questions. I, I think I did an okay job explaining it, um, but, uh, you know, please, just and pl please, for, uh, you know, for those handouts and just in general, um, you know, please raise the questions when you have them. Um, I try to respond to Slack in a timely fa fashion. And while I prefer, you know, that you pose your questions in the class channel so that everybody can see them, I know that sometimes, you know, you're not comfortable doing that or you're worried that you're going to reveal, you know, something about your, your code and, and you don't want to you know, have to worry about that. That's fine. Send it to me as a, as a DM um, and I'll get back to you. I want to make sure that you have all the information that you need. I think I give that to you, but I know from experience there are some things that, um, that, uh, that I always find that there are things that, um, I, you know, I, I thought I had conveyed and not conveyed effectively. So um, you know, please ask your questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's it for tonight then. Uh, I think we've had enough. So next week, just one more time, uh, please plan to be in class in person. We'll be doing pair programming. Um, I think that, that'll, be, that'll be exciting. You'll have an opportunity to put your uh, Java programming and um, uh, and uh, test driven development skills, uh, it, it, um, you know, into uh, into practice here in the classroom uh, with with one of your peers, um, and uh, also, you know, we'll be doing um, some, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do a couple of katas. We'll be uh, we'll be writing some code together. Um, it'll be good. And you know, for me, uh, you know, th th this is the. Um, this is the, the the unique part of this class, which is doing these in class activities, um, and that's why like all the lectures and stuff are are online. Um, you can do that, you know, when it makes sense for you to do that during the week. Uh, but let's all get together in real time to uh, code together. Which will we do? So, thanks, everybody. Have a good week. Yeah.